Good morning, everybody. And welcome to today's session from Ha huh? to Aha, the science of data visualization. My name is Larry Silverstein, and I'm a sales consultant at Tableau. Next week will be my four year anniversary. Thank you. Uh, prior to that, <laughs> for 12 years, I worked at another business intelligence company. And they also had a dashboarding tool. And it let me do some somewhat silly things. I'll give you an example. We were working with a car company, and we would thought, and we thought, wouldn't it be cool if we made a dashboard that looks like a car dashboard? And we did that. We used things like gauges and meters and dials and all other kinds of embellishments. And we delivered it to the executives, and they loved it. It was beautiful. They loved it for about one day. Here's the problem. As beautiful as it was, because of it, the way it was designed, those meters took up a lot of space. They didn't get a lot of information. There was like no context to it. They never really adopted it. Then I came over to Tableau, and I quickly started to realize that there's a lot of goodness baked into the product to guide you to create effective visualizations. So with that, we're here today, and I thank you for that. Tell your friends tomorrow I'll be down the hall in room D at 9 o'clock. So this session is kind of a twofer. First, I'm going to go into the science of data visualization. It's not so much about Tableau as what went into it. Our secret sauce, VizQL, Visual Query Language, it's science, it's biology, and psychology guides you into creating really effective content. And I'm going to be speaking generically about dashboards today, but it really applies whether you're doing a dashboard, a story, an infographic, or a simple sheet. Right? We want people to be able to see it and quickly understand it. The second part of the session will be more on the best practices. It's more of the, you know, what you could take to the bank. What are the best practices for building those dashboards? So as I go through this, I'd like you to think to yourself about you know, a dashboard, a piece of content that you've created that maybe didn't get quite the imp have the impact that you had expected. You know, think of a couple of things that you might pick up along the way that might make it better. OK, so let's get into the science. But I wanted to get the juices flowing with an example. Here's an example of an eye-popping visualization. And you know, it, it is eye-popping, but it's got problems. When you look at this, you might think that the Americas at 11% is bigger than Africa at 18%. And true, you know, obviously, that's not true. When you create something like this, and there are times to be eye-popping, like if you're, you're a blogger and you want to get people to to really explore and, and read into your blog. But something like this is problematic because it makes your brain go into overdrive and really figure out, what am I really looking at here? I don't want to give away too much of what's up ahead, but in this case, simply doing a bar chart helps you to make meaningful comparisons. So if you were a blogger and you put that first 3D thing on your page, you might lose a lot of credibility. So I advise you not do that. Here's something that's probably nearer and dearer to all of you, the crosstab report. And there are times when you want to deliver something like this, like if you need an exact number. But if I were to ask you a question such as, which subcategory has, is the least profitable? Well, you, know, you could grind it out, but it's, it's not easy to do. It would take a, a while. And if you gave this to an executive, they may not even bother. But what if I make one small enhancement to this? All right, so now what I've done is I've taken anything that's negative and I made it red. Well, it's better, but it's still not exactly where we need to be. It's, it's better because now there's fewer things your brain has to scan, but you still have to do some arithmetic. You still have to put some things in your memory. 
And if we had more rows and columns, it's still not gonna be very effective. But what if I show this, and even if I didn't give you the numbers, just by the color of the bar, if it's black, large positive, gray, small positive, red, negative, plus we also have the orientation of the bars, to the right is good, to the left is bad, without even doing any math, you could just look at this and go, it's those tables. And those of you who know Superstore always know it's those tables that are the problem. All right, let's play a little game as we start to understand the science of data visualization. I call this game Count the Nines. All right, how many nines do we have out there? Shout it out. <laughs> We're getting all kind of random. There's no prizes, but suppose now I just do this, kind of like the trick I did before, where I give you a little color. Now you can probably shout out the right answer. 10 is the right answer. So let's go into like, pretty obvious, hey, you, you made it colorful, it was easier, but we're gonna get more into the science behind it. But here's another game. I'm gonna give you this report. Let's make believe you're a director of sales for the United States. One, two, three, four across the top. Those are your regions, north, south, east, and west. X is your store sales. Y is your store profitability. All right, sales managers, you got this great report. What do you do now? Ooh, no answer is, you say, come on, Larry, be fair, be fair. I need some stats, man. Give me means, give me variances, give me some linear regression information. All right, I'm gonna help you out, I'm gonna give that to you. Yeah, it's not gonna help so much. Pretty much the same to within decimal places. All right, sales managers, what do you do now? Throw up your hands, or, you could do what Francis Anscombe did. So this is a famous data set. Show of hands, who has heard of Anscombe's quartet? Couple of people. So he created this data set to prove a couple of points. The first is, is that to analyze data, you should plot it, see it visually. And the second thing is, is he wanted to um, show the impact of outliers on a data set. So now that you see it visually, if you're a store manager, you might look at the bottom left-hand quadrant and say, wow, look at that store that's all the way up there. We want to interview that person, find out what they're doing so well that drives store sales and profitability through the roof. Or in the bottom right-hand corner, we see a bunch of them above the line. We want to talk to them, try to bring up the folks that are under the, under the line. And of course, as you probably know, and I'm preaching to the choir with Tableau, you might want to encode more information. The size of the circle could be the average discounts you're giving out. You might even want to drop in the categories of your products on color and get even greater insight. So what we want to try to do, and what Tableau does for you natively, if you let it do its job, is we want to force the people looking at your content to use the visual cortex, cortex of their brain. That's where they're just seeing things and it pops out. Now there are times when you need to use your cerebral cortex, that's for deeper thinking, but remember, especially if you're building content for executives, they want to see things fast, right? They don't want to have to grind through numbers. So what are some of the things that make visualizations stand out? Scientists call this pre-attentive attributes. The name says what it seems to be saying. It's before you even pay attention in milliseconds. These are the things that will stand out. Size of objects, the orientation, whether they're in clothes and so on, color. As we go on, we'll get deeper into this and you'll see they're not all equal in their effectiveness, but there's a time for all of them. So I'm going to show you a quick video now by Christopher Healy of the North Carolina State University. So in this video, he's going to show some of those pretensive attributes and he's gonna show you things really fast. They're gonna flicker. And you're gonna tell whether or not you can, you can see what he's trying to show. And the whole idea is that it's really fast. You know, how effective is it as a pretensive attribute? You'll also notice that there are times 
when, when you combine these pretentive attributes, it may actually be too much of a good thing and you get what he calls visual interference. This video will demonstrate a number of pretentive features, tasks, and visual interference which can occur in the low-level human visual system. To begin, consider a simple target detection task. Try to determine whether a target red circle is present or absent in a sea of blue circles. Apart from viewers who are red blue colorblind, the target is easily identified as present or absent in each display. Notice that increasing the number of elements and decreasing exposure duration does not make identification more difficult. Pre-attentive tasks are rapid, accurate, and independent of display size. Other visual features are also pre-attentive. For example, shape or curvature. Try searching for a red circle in a sea of red squares. Experiments have shown this task is also pre-attentive. These results might suggest we can display two attributes simultaneously, one with color, the other with shape. Try finding a red circle in a combined background of blue circles and red squares. Put simply, this search is very difficult. Targets with no unique visual feature form a conjunction. Users must scan serially through the display searching for the target. This task is not pre attentive and shows exactly the kind of visual interference we would like to avoid. Other tasks are also pre attentive For example, boundary identification. Try to determine if the hue boundary is horizontal or vertical. Notice that some displays use a constant shape, while others vary the shape randomly across the array. This has no effect on our ability to identify the hue boundary. Let's reverse the data feature mapping and try to identify a boundary formed by a difference in shape. Shape boundaries displayed with constant color are easy to detect. A random color pattern, however, masks the shape boundary. This type of visual interference is known as feature hierarchy. For this task, the visual system favors color over shape. Again, we want to avoid this kind of visual masking effect during visualization. Although these examples... Okay. All right, let's get into some other topics and try to learn more about what either helps or you know, detracts from an effective visualization. So we as human beings have memory limits. We can only hold roughly six things in our head at the same time. So if I showed you this table and asked a couple of questions, one is gonna be a lot tougher than the other. For example, have we gained or lost customers over the last four years? Pretty simple, I gave you a total line. You can quickly discern that it increased from 2009 to 2012. But if I ask you which city has grown the fastest, that's tougher. But if I showed it to you as a line chart, it's now a lot easier. That's because I've chunked four data values into one pattern, making it much easier to compare. So to go back to the point I was making before, you know, we went from 16 numbers down to four patterns. Four patterns is well within our ability to remember things. So how do we overcome memory limits? So I'm gonna go through some examples of these. So this is something ripped off the internet. There's a fun website called viz.wtf, which is some ex really poor examples of visualization, not to poke fun at the people, they're all trying to tell stories with data, they're just not doing it very effectively. So if I looked at this particular chart, 
I mean, first of all, it's, a, it's kind of a pie chart, but then they do circles within circles. Now, if you're going to use a pie chart, I mean, you have so many slices, it becomes really hard to compare. And, and then you end up with pointers and a lot of text, and then you have to actually give people the actual numbers. So not terribly effective. And you'll notice there's a comment at the bottom. I didn't write this. This is from the website that says, classic case of would be better as a bar chart. Now, I didn't have that data, but for you folks, I lovingly handcrafted all the data, and I did exactly that. I turned it into a bar chart, and I tried to also do some of that silliness of the circle within circle, showing the total number of internet users, the high-speed internet users, and I used a different color to separate that from the countries. You know, and when you look at that original pie chart, you have India, and they give you the number, but then it says countries outside of the top 20 on the other side. You don't even know if it's more or less. But when I do it as a bar chart, even if I didn't give you the numbers, you can line it up and see that the countries outside of the top 20 is actually less than India. So proof that this was definitely a more effective visualization. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, good. I also mentioned that visual interruptions can make people slow. I'll give you a real world example. Let's start with something fun. I want you to study this picture and I'm gonna create an interruption and I'm going to change something, and I want you to tell me what changed. Study. Here we go. Okay. What changed? Any, any answers? It's not the same. Some the same. Except, like, when I do this with other people, I say, oh, you know, you, you changed the windows, the shading on the ground. Not at all. All I really did was gave a little haircut to the tree, right? So I hear some laughter, <laughs> but it, it now plays a real role in when designing a dashboard, and I'll give you an example. So let's say you build a dashboard. It's really two different dashboards that are, will communicate with each other. So I'm looking at this dashboard, and I go to my consumer segment, and I see something that's not doing well in profitability, so I click on that. Then I click on the next bar, it's suffering in profitability. I go down to a point, and now I've got a hyperlink to show me the order detail, and I'm gonna leave that visualization entirely and go somewhere else. If you knew your products really well, because we start with products, maybe you know what subcategory and what category they belong to, but unless you really took note of it, you might have forgotten what segment you started in. So what I'm saying here is try to keep all the information if possible on one dashboard. All right, let's get into some more topics. We're gonna to talk about color, how people like to see different data types, which chart types work better than the others, as well as layouts. And what I mean by layout is, is there like some kind of guidance on screen real estate? What gets the most impact? So first of all, when it comes to colors, I mean, Tableau gives you a lot of choices. But the experts in data visualization will say, Try to use the more muted tones, if possible, and stay away from emphasis colors. There's some issues with emphasis colors. The first being that your brain is hardwired to have meaning, semantic meaning to those colors. So when we see something that's in red, usually we think that it's a dire situation. If it's in green, we're doing well. But if you say, take that same dashboard, show it to someone in China, Red actually means good fortune. Not great. So the second thing is, is that 1% of women, roughly speaking, and 10% of men are colorblind. The real term is color vision deficiency, but we'll, we'll keep it to colorblind to keep things simple. So here's an example where you might feel obligated to make your dashboard lo look more interesting by double encoding. But there's a problem here for the reasons I mentioned a moment ago. Because when you look at the chart on the left, I don't know about you, but my eyes get drawn to red. It's a warning color, but if that top number 400,000 is a good thing, there are some countries doing better than Slovakia and some doing worse. And when we see Czech Republic is green, well, usually we think good, but, but not necessarily. The scientific term here is double encoding. In this case, the position of the bars, we've sorted them, as we see on the right-hand side, using a muted tone is far more effective. It 
does not force your brain to try to decode the colors. So it's actually superior. You might think the left one is more fun, but it comes with issues. You might wonder, is there a time when it makes sense to color the bars for the dimensions like we see here? It could, like if you're grouping some objects or you had some kind of a hierarchy. Here we see um, items within the category. That's okay, that works. And, and if you're going to use a background, make it consistent throughout. Your brain plays tricks on you. So if I showed you this picture and said, which of the internal squares is darkest, you're probably thinking it's the one on the far left. But if I drew a border around it, you'll see that your brain was playing tricks on you. They're the same. And hold on to this one because this is gonna come back to haunt us a little later. And much like our eyes and our brains can only, uh, our brains can only hold like four to six elements at, elements at a time, when it comes to color, you know, eight is about the maximum amount of colors that we could really discern. So if we drop states onto the color shelf as we have here, not really helpful. Earlier before when I said overcoming memory limits, I talked about large legends. This is what I meant by large legends, not necessarily physically big, which is a waste of space, but I meant the number of things in it. This is more helpful. We've got less than eight colors here, and now you can actually see patterns emerging. It's useful. So the different types of data, and we'll talk about you know, the best ways to look at them. A couple of qualitative types. One is nominal, names of people, places, your favorite beers. An ordinal, like the medals in the Olympics or survey data. Love it, like it, hate it. And of course, all important quantitative data, your measures, whether they're in raw units or dollars or percentages or pounds, right? How do we encode that? So this is a hierarchy and it's a generalization. And going back to this slide, there are some times when color might work better than position, but in general, it's position, color, size, and shape. Now at the outset of the presentation, I said this part of the presentation wasn't so much about Tableau as the science behind it, but now I want to just show you the science behind it. So you feel confident knowing you get a good viz. So if, if I just go into Tableau, double click on sales, it puts it up for me on the row shelf. Column and row is your position. Remember the hierarchy? Position is number one. That's by design. The column and row shelf is front and center and we read left to right, top to bottom. The next would be color, and then size, just like in the hierarchy. And if I went into um, the shape, the fourth thing. Now here's an example where maybe we get some of that visual interference that Christopher Healy talked about in that quick video. It's getting a little rough to understand. I mean, there are times you can use the shape, don't get me wrong, to make meaningful visualizations, but here, not so helpful. Now, what kind of charts should we use? And again, these are generalizations, and one thing I try to tell people, especially when they're new to Tableau, is look, you're the person who has to get the story across. So choose the chart type that tells the story the best, but there are some great defaults in Tableau. In general, if it's time, we like it on the x-axis, if it's location on a map, and so on. But you won't break your data, and Show Me allows you to quickly iterate and see which type of chart is the best one to tell your story. All right. I see a lot of pie charts, and I work a lot with financial services companies. You see it all the time, and it's not a great visualization, all right? Pie charts get quite a beating. In fact, one of the earliest versions of Tableau didn't include a pie chart. And our customers were asking for it. They said, why, is it hard to implement? It's like, no, it's not hard to implement a pie chart. We've done so much else in Tableau. It's not a good visualization in almost all instances. And then we succumb to pressure. You know what happened next? The purists out there in the visualization will beat us up. Why would you put a pie chart in? But anyway, as you can see here, here's the problem with a pie chart. First of all, if you have a lot of slices, 
it's really hard to compare them. I gave you the numbers on the pie chart. So let's say we want to compare us to competitor B. If I didn't give you the numbers, now these slices are next to each other, it makes it a little easier, but still hard to do. Imagine if it was like a cross from it, you'd never be able to tell. But if I lay it out in a bar chart, so that's my le lesson number one is like, bar charts in most case is your most effective visual tool for making comparisons. And I didn't use a lot of color like in the pie chart, I just sorted them and I used the slightly different U to show us, right? And now we can see, even if I didn't give you the numbers, we're trailing competitor B by just a smidgen. And some people just can't break away from Excel. They love their tables. And I'm gonna show you later on how to escape that, right? What's the cure for the crosstab? But there are times when you want crosstab, like if, if you need an exact value, like a tax table, uh, a bus schedule, right? But, and again, I'm probably preaching to the choir, in most cases, charts are better than tables for spotting trends. Now, I'm not showing you every value like I showed you a moment ago. Um, this is probably the average across a year. But don't forget that you can use things like tooltips to show additional information if people are really curious, or, and I don't wanna go ahead too far, something called the guided analytic for getting the actual detail. When I started, I talked about that car dashboard, which had gauges and meters and dials and chart junk. Stephen Few, one of the experts in the industry, he claims to have developed what he calls the bullet chart. That, that's in Show Me in Tableau. Much more effective because it gives you context. The length of the bar or the thick part of the bar is the performance measure, you know, your actuals. You get a comparative symbol marker. Maybe that represents last year, perhaps it represents a goal that you're shooting for. You get a title, that you, so you know exactly what it is you're looking for. And then you can use background fill colors to give you qualitative ranges like bad, satisfactory, and good. And you could line these puppies up in a very succinct fashion, show it to your executives, they'll be able to see where you're above or below very quickly. So as much as I love and admire the bar chart, when it comes to showing data over time, it's not a, as effective as the line chart. The problem is, is that the weight and the size of the bars hides the patterns underneath, where a line chart is much more effective. Now, on the same token, line charts are usually, I don't like to say always, usually more effective only when you have time. But I do want to make an additional point about lines. So in the chart a second ago, let me go back, when I show you the line chart, notice I didn't actually do the points. That kind of wastes what we call data ink, and I'll get to that in a little while. But in this case, I'm showing you the points. So let's imagine that we're looking at toxin levels, but they're collected at irregular intervals, so we don't have every single data point. My question to you is, are you telling your viewers the truth about the data if you connect the lines for them? The answer is probably not, as I show you now on the left-hand side. That's the actual data. So as much as we like line charts over time, my lesson here is, is that if you have irregular intervals, better to use what we call a dot plot, like we see on the right, because then you're not forcing people into making erroneous conclusions. And being in this industry for a long time and having worked with products that create 3D, I now know better. People always say, oh, when is Tableau gonna have 3D? And, and I tell them, don't wait for it, don't hold your breath. The reason is, is that it suffers from a problem called data occlusion, which means something is hidden. Now, I'm not gonna do it now because I'm gonna hurt myself, but when I do this presentation, I'll often stand up on the lectern and I wanna look down at December of 1900 because I know there's data there, but I just can't see it. And some people may say, well, there are tools which allow you to spin the 3D object. That's great, isn't it? And I say, yeah, not exactly, because remember I talked about 
um, not creating interruptions. As soon as you spin something, now you're hiding something else. It's hard to show something that's truly 3D on a flat screen. Tableau recommends you create what's called small multiples. It's unique to Tableau. It allows you to see multiple dimensions at the same time, and nothing is hidden. I can see every single data point, and I can also see patterns. This is the same data on the left and right. I hope you like the one on the right better. Please say yes. OK. All right, maps. It's got a geography. It's probably a no-brainer. States, countries, cities, zip codes. Maps are great, right? Usually, you see, here's the problem with maps. And I shouldn't say it's a problem. I don't want to discourage you. They're, they're awesome. But think about what I talked about that hierarchy before. Because you're using a geography, you've now lost position and length. Because the position is actually the location, the latitude and longitude. And you can't use a length of a line. So you have to go a little lower in that hierarchy to size and color. And our brains can't do as great a job looking at sizes of circles or color hue to, to, to get exact details. But it, maps are awesome. You do see trends and patterns, OK? But I'm just saying a little bit of a warning there. When you have one measure, you can use what's called in Tableau's show me is this filled map or you can use the scientific name and impress your friends, chloropath maps. It's hard to say. Um, but something's going to come back to haunt us. And I told you to hold on to that, that, that background problem I talked about before. So look at Texas, for example. It's dark green. The, the states around it, your brain is going to have a little trouble tabulating like how light is that really. So just remember that problem. And in fact, you might want to always use a symbol map instead of a filled map. It's, you know, I leave that up to you to decide what tells your story better. You definitely need a symbol map when you have two measures. Another problem with maps is think of projections. As a kid, I loved to play the game Risk. Anybody play Risk? Remember Greenland was like the key to winning, right? Well, on a projected map, Greenland looks bigger. So the color that you might throw on a filled map might make you think that Greenland is you know, the biggest rock star in the world and Rhode Island isn't doing anything. So remember the projection problem. You might want to consider using symbol maps more often. But it gets really exciting with Tableau because maps aren't limited to just cities, states, zip codes. Anything that can be drawn on an XY coordinate system can be a map. Our company is based in Seattle. They had a brag. This is their content. They had a brag about Felix Hernandez of the Mariners pitching a perfect game. But it's a great example because here, the strike zone is a map where you're using the colors to tell if the batter swung, if it was a called strike, and so on. So just think of the opportunities that you might have, whether it's like looking at your plant floor or you know, what have you. You can create anything as a map. I've seen uh, dentists use a map of the mouth to, for their patients to show where they have cavities. OK. Let's get on to screen real estate. Where should things go? So in general, and I always like to say in general, in the, in the Americas, um, Israel would be the opposite. But here in, in the United States, we usually think, look at things top to bottom, left to right. So the emphasis quadrant is the upper left-hand corner or something that's in the middle. So if you've got the most important KPIs, you want to get that across, put it in the high emphasis zones. And I'll, I'll just say this one thing. Most people put a logo in, the, in that spot. And that bothers me because, especially if it's an internal dashboard, you know what company you work for, right? Shouldn't we? At Tableau, we have millions of dashboards, as you can imagine. I don't think I've ever seen a logo on any of them. So this is a generalization, but now I'd like to uh, play a, a very quick snippet here. It's, not, it's just a, a screenplay. from, And you can go to our website and see all the research. I just did a couple of examples from the Tableau research and design system where they wanted to show like what's the impact of using big font on numbers. So I'll just play this through. And you can see the eye scans. That's what they did. They captured what people are looking at. And what they found is, is that visual attention is paid to very large font. 
especially early in the viewing sequence, like the first time that something is viewed. So the lesson here, if you want to get a number across, make it big. Maybe not that surprising, but it's good to know. Now, I, I talked about a little bit about, you know, different chart types. So I'm creating a dashboard. Hey, Larry, should I have like 15 different chart types? You know, bar, line chart, heat map, regular map, whatever. well, you don't want to make people's brains explode by having too many things. But there is something to say about using the same thing over and over and it's the only thing. So that's what this one is proving as we look at this particular eye scan, which they use the term repetition fatigue, which means that attention wanes based on left, right, and up, down sequence. So you might want to mix it up a little bit. I think that's the lesson that they're trying to tell us. And understand again that the most important thing should be earlier in the viewing sequence, which means upper left hand corner, right? And then moving to the right. Okay, so that was a lot of science and there were some practical things in there as well. Let's now get into the meat and potatoes, the, the best practices for building dashboards and you know, like I said before, other kinds of content. So I'm going to refer back to our friend Stephen Few, one of the experts in the industry, and I'm going to use a pretensive attribute of color to highlight on what he says are the most important things. It should be visual. It should have the most important information. It should be on a single screen, and people should be able to monitor it at a glance. And now kind of a rhetorical question. Are all dashboards the same? Of course the answer is no, but I want to explain a little bit. So, um, Andy Kirk is another expert in dashboards and visualizations. He says there's really two types of dashboards, exploratory and explanatory. I'll give you some examples. Here's a typical exploratory dashboard. You probably build these yourselves. Pretty common. You got those nice big facts across the top, lots of charts, uh, quick filters. You could probably click on the dashboard and filter some more. The point here is, is that it's neutral. It's, it's not doing anything other than saying, I'm here, go find the story and the data yourself. Right? Very effective. The other type, and this is an unfortunate story, but it's, it's a very powerful one, is explanatory. It's like an op-ed piece. It's opinionated. You're trying to get people to come to your side. So you'll notice here that it's called Iraq's Bloody Toll. And notice the effective use of, it looks like red dripping blood. Now this, the person who authored this did something that is usually a no-no because they actually flipped the axis so that the bigger numbers are on the bottom. But in this case, it's probably pretty obvious that it's the biggest value because that's the point they're trying to make. But because this is opinionated, I can actually tell a different story with the same exact data. For example, if I take it and I flip it, and instead of calling it Iraq's bloody toll, I call it Iraq, deaths on the decline. Now this is obviously a horrible time in Iraq's history, but this is a more positive spin and it's completely true. It actually is decreasing. And then to really put the icing on the cake, I could make it a more neutral color. So that's really the big difference between exploratory and explanatory. It's, it's an opinion. So which one should you use? And of course, like everything in data viz and business intelligence, the answer is it depends. You know, what is your goal here? Well, it's always going to be the same goal. It's to make better data-driven de decisions and to make changes for the better. So now we get to the crux of today's presentation, from huh to aha to aha. Because when you give something to somebody to look at, you want them to understand it quickly. You want it to pass what we call the five second test. And literally, somebody should be able to look at your vision, even if they're not in the same line of business as you are, they should be able to discern what this is about. And this is actually a really fine example. We got a good name, Finding Bigfoot. There's 
there's no guessing what this dashboard is about. The map is obviously showing where we have the most sightings. There's a nice little bar chart on the right, seasonally, when do we see them? The bottom, over time, when have we seen the most big feet? And you know, at the very bottom, different classifications of the sightings. So what are some tips and tricks for dashboarding for that five seconds test? Well, I already mentioned before, no surprise, the most important things, top or top left. Legends should go near their views. I often see people put legends on like the opposite side of the screen. You don't want people's eyes to have to look the other way because then you're kind of losing your flow. Try to use consistent color schemes throughout like you see here. And the next one again, not a hard and fast rule. I've seen great dashboards with 10 different views and I've seen really poor dashboards with one view. But in general, three, four, five is probably a sweet spot. And unless you're doing something that's printed, try to provide interactivity. Give people the opportunity to explore, hover over, get additional details. The next advice says use your words. And this is a double-edged sword. I'm gonna name drop another famous name, probably the most famous one in data viz, Edward Tufte. Hands, who's, who's heard of Tufte? Half of you, good. Good number of you. He talks about something called data ink ratios. What that means is that the data should be taking center stage, not silly embellishments, right? Or, you know, more subtly, even grid lines, I don't know if you ever noticed with Tableau, you get very, very faint grid lines. Right? BI products of the past made them very dark, and even bars had lines around them. That is very distracting. There are times when it is good to add some stuff. For example, in the bottom right-hand corner, you have reference lines. That's not part of the data, but it gives the user or the viewer of this additional context. Titles are very effective. This is not an effective one called executive dashboard. It'd be a little better if they told you, gave you more context. But giving an effective title is important. And notice along the top where we have those big font, big fonted numbers of your most important things. Notice that being an executive dashboard, we didn't do it down to the penny level. We abbreviated M for millions. That's another great thing to do. You don't want to make people scan huge numbers. And although I'm saying save your data ink for the data, use tooltips. When people hover over something, give them that additional information that they're seeking. But make the data center stage. Here's another great example from one of our best at Tableau, Andy Cockreave. Hope, hopefully you've gotten to see him speak before. He actually won an internal contest with this particular visualization. And this one is just exemplary formatting. Notice that he's not using too many different chart types, but he did mix it up a little bit, right? He's got that heat map in the middle. Notice the nice use of annotations, but not overwhelming. And the color scheme, I mean, Tableau gives you so many different color schemes. Here we went for one that was very pleasing to the eye. Red to gray, very effective. And here's something that most people probably don't think about, is getting feedback. To pass the five second test, you are not a fair test if you've created it. You're married to that visualization. You probably think it's the best thing ever. My advice to you is seek out somebody. If it's, if it's sensitive data, only show it to people in your department. But if you can, show it to your family. Show it to friends, put it on the data viz community, again, if it's not sensitive data. Now, you don't have to listen to all the feedback, but if people look at it and they go like this, it's like 30 seconds, yeah, I don't get it. Ask why, then iterate. Tableau lets you iterate very quickly. Eventually, you're gonna have something, as you get feedback, it's pretty good, publish it. You can always get more feedback and make it better later on, but my advice is really seek out feedback. So now on to a slightly different topic. Here's a problem I see quite a lot, especially for people that are new to Tableau. 
they could create these cross-tab charts real fast with quick filters. And it doesn't perform well, well that's a whole other story. But the big problem with this, with this is that it doesn't really prompt any action. Like, what do you do next? It forces the user to, to you know, go through all those filters to find what they think is interesting and they'll, they'll probably just end up exporting into Excel. So I talked earlier on about you know, the secret is what we could, to get away from this Excel mentality, because this is an Excel mentality and people are stuck in it all the time. The antidote is the guided analytic. Now, ultimately, you're going to give people the chance to see the raw data, but just the information that they need. I'll show you what I mean. So instead of having all those quick filters across the top, I'm using charts instead to guide them in the analysis. So I look at furniture, and I see that it's struggling in profitability. Then I go to the next thing, tables. Now watch what happens when I get to the next level. Now it actually did a little trick in case you're wondering, whoa, let me show that again. How did you suddenly magically make the map have itself and only show up, uh, show the data on the right hand side? That's the guided analysis. Those are the raw numbers that you probably were looking for all this time, but I didn't have to fiddle with a bunch of quick filters. So the one trick is to use canvases, and this isn't really you know, about how to use Tableau session, but it, you know, in case you're really interested, uh, from your actions, there's a radio button that says exclude all values. What you're saying to Tableau is only show the values when they're expressly requested. It'll actually make your dashboard a lot faster as well. So the guided analytic is the cure for your executives or, or workers who say, oh, I really need you to create me a cross step. No, you don't. They need a guided analytic. You need to show them the future. OK. So the last topic is you may be wondering, is there a subjective way to know how effective my visits, even if you got feedback from a lot of people? And I'll go back again to Stephen Few, who published an article probably within the last year called the Data Visualization Effectiveness Profile. And he's got a couple of different um, areas that he groups some uh, uh, topics to. Informative and emotive, where you know, we look at, is it useful? Meaning, is what we're looking at important to the recipient of that visualization? And is it complete to the point where it shows all the data that I need to really understand it, but no more? And of course, there's also the emotive aspects, how beautiful it is, is it engaging? And when you look at those criteria, some of them are more important than the others. So, uh, than the others. Truthfulness is your number one goal. Because if you're using Tableau to lie to people, I'm going to come find you, and you're in big trouble, right? But truthfulness is the most important thing. And there's a little more wiggle room when it comes to the aesthetics. At the very least, don't make it ugly. It doesn't have to be, like, especially if you've got to do it real fast, but it should at least be pleasing to the eye. That's the way he puts it. So let's take a look at a couple of examples, and we'll see how well they do um, by those attributes. So here's a 3D bar chart. <gasps> 3D. And there's a title, sales are improving. But do we really have enough context to know sales are improving? And notice that this person is lying to us. It's subtle. They're lying to us. Look at where the bar chart starts, 150,000. When you do a bar chart, you're not allowed to start at 150,000. You have to start at zero. Otherwise, you're, you're really messing up people's visual system. You're not getting an accurate portrayal of the data. How did this one do? Not so great on the truthfulness aspect because of that, as well as the fact that you may need more information than just revenue numbers. Also, for all we know, I'll go back, maybe the company acquired somebody else and in the last four months it just looks like sales are much better. How many of you know the Menard example, the classic example? From 1869, probably before he had access to Tableau, um, he put a lot into this visualization. Uh, th the thickness of those bands is showing troop strength. The color is showing the direction, going from, Mos uh, from Moscow to, I'm sorry, from Poland to Moscow, and then black is on the way back. He's got temperature, he's got dates, he's got it all going on in there. 
So how did he do for 1869? Pretty, pretty good. Now, he took a little ding from Stephen Few on intuitiveness, but because it's so engaging and the story is so rich, you take the time to figure it out. You might also have to learn French, but that shouldn't be a big barrier. All right, so that's what I had for you today. Here's some recommended readings. I've mentioned a lot of names today. Few and Tufty, and there's ones from people that are here today like Cotgreave and, and others and Albert Cairo, and there's lots of books out there. So I hope that as you reflect on this, you know, think about it, something that you've created and go back and like, what are a couple of tips? Get feedback from people and then apply a couple of tips. So what I'll do now is, uh, oh, I gotta ask you to please complete the session survey. I come from the East Coast in New Jersey and I work out of the home office and if I don't get good grades, they're not gonna let me out of the house again. So no pressure, no, no pressure. But no, I do please, I, I need the feedback. So we have some time for questions. There are some microphones that are up there. Um, as people might be thinking about some questions, I'll start with one that I hear quite a bit. People sometimes say, it's like, look, I got two measures I want to plot. One of them is huge, and the other one is much smaller. And when I show them, let's say, on a line chart, the one at the top is, is great. I get to see a lot of stuff. The one at the bottom looks like a flat line along the bottom, right? Or if I'm doing a bar chart, you get a huge bar and then something that you don't see anything. What do you do? Some people will use a dual axis chart. Um, the guidance that I get from the readings that I've done are, they're okay, dual axis. You know what I'm talking about? We have two separate scales on the left side of the chart and the right side of the chart. But sometimes people that don't understand visualization might draw erroneous conclusions, like they may see some kind of correlation between the two. That doesn't really exist. Now, if you believe your story is told well and served well by dual axis, go for it. But don't be afraid just to have the two charts side by side or top to bottom. Tableau lets you do that really easily. Sometimes it's just better to break it out into two separate charts. Some people like the idea of having a bar with like a gap, like, oh, we're jumping from 500 to a million, so you can see the smaller values. But again, you're just fooling people. They're not gonna really be able to appreciate the immensity of, of the bigger value. So, so break it out. Anybody, I can't even see, are there any questions? All right, so again, I hope today was useful. Please go ahead and um, hope you can apply this to your day-to-day -day work. Thank you, everybody. Oh, we do have a question. I can't see, sorry, there is. Oh, we're not done, sit down. No. Okay. I apologize for being slow. No, it's okay. Um, so what kind of weight would you give to, for example, like corporate branding? Um, you know, a lot of times corporations may have certain colors that they're used to, and, and that's okay to, you know, use, I guess, for emotional purposes because we're familiar with it, but at the same time, it may break some of those natural rules. Don't use red for this, don't use blue for that. Like, oh, I'll yeah, I, I, I get that. Yeah, so I work a lot with financial services, and they, they lock it down, too. So my advice there is, you talk about branding, is if it's an internal, piece yes. of content, yeah. if you have to have, maybe don't do a logo at all, or put it in the, the right corner instead of the left one where it doesn't take that center stage. The same thing also when it comes to you know, the color schemes, is you might want to consider that only if it's going to be externally showed to clients. I know that there are certain rules you have to do. So, I mean, that's, that's a tricky one, but some of my customers, the, you know, over time what they do is they, they show what a visualization might look like with other colors, see how much more effective this can be, right? And then they might say, all right, for internal use, we might be able to allow other colors, but when you have the corporate branding externally, you gotta stick with it. It is what it is. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Good, good. Uh, anybody else? Yes, I yes. have a question. Hi. Uh, I guess this isn't more in terms of the design aspect, but I guess more in terms of change management, if you have like, dealing with leaders that are just used to seeing um, metrics or KPIs in a very specific way. Yeah. Like, is there any tips or advice about yeah. trying to change their behavior or like, um, I guess trying to have leadership buy into a new visualization because sometimes when you're trying to go from like the bottom up to show something that is very useful, but if leaders aren't used to seeing that, 
um, usually gets shot down. So just seeing if you have any advice about that. No kidding. Yeah. I actually, if in case you didn't answer, if I didn't get any other questions, that was my question number two to get people going. How do you break away from that? My advice to you, and this is really effective, is you know when you publish something to Tableau, you can actually see what people are looking at, right? How many views you might get. So I would say use what's known as marketing A-B techniques. You know what that's about. Where create the, the, the dashboard that the executive expects, as crummy as you might think it is. It looks like Excel with lots of cross tabs. Give them that. You might even do A, B, and C. Give them then another one, which is a little bit more along the lines of a powerful visual paradigm. And then C might be the very best thing that you would wish that they would like. Publish them. Watch over time. I bet a nickel that C will win. Because they'll start to understand that the first one that they thought was really good, what they were used to, didn't give them any context, didn't really give them any actions to take, whereas B and C you know, will help get them to that point of true visual bliss. Does that help? Yeah, that does. Thank you. Got a couple more minutes if there's other questions. Don't be shy, come right up. All right, you get four minutes back in your day. Oh, well, hey, keep Sorry. <laughs> okay. You can leave and I can ask this, but. No, the, no, please do. The statistician in me defines truthfulness and completeness maybe a little differently than my audience might perceive that. Okay. So I struggle with do you, I'm over here. I see. Do I, do I include like confidence bands and, and those kinds of things that add validity and credibility sure. to, your, to the display? but always require defining and explaining to the audience. Is there anything, I start, my colleagues and I have this argument all the time. <laughs> so you want to like give, give them more visual, yeah, a, a more textual a, understanding of what you're looking at? Yeah, like, like confidence bands on a trend line and you know, those kinds of things. Well, first of all, always go for it. Use them, they're very powerful. But if you want to give them like more meat behind what it is, um, on one of the examples we showed earlier, I'll just go back to it real fast. Where was that? One of the good examples that we had here. Let me just go find that one real fast. So it's something like this. They've got like that question mark with a popover. You might want to actually give like some kind of a definition right there. When they hover over, it's like another tooltip, but might explain what it is you're looking at how to decode what it is. Is that along the lines okay. that you're looking for? Because there's really no space on the dashboard. In these cases, maybe you don't want to waste the space on a lot of text. Yeah, that's, that's the So that might help. Some people actually will just have another tab in their dashboard that just might be like a dictionary or in your case, ex, you know, some kind of commentary. You might want to just have another tab entirely depending on how complex it is. Okay. But use the tooltips, you know, if you can. That's a good idea. Okay, thanks. Great. All right, now you get two and a half minutes back. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>